Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Roger Bunkel. Well, thank you very much for that splendid um, introduction. I'm a bit embarrassed. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here speaking to you today and a great honor to be sharing a platform with these two esteemed gentlemen. Um, you heard in the, in the introduction that I established Capital Economics uh, in 1999. That's right. In fact, uh, it, Capital Economics shares a birthday with the Euro, ironically. <laughs> uh, they said Capital Economics was bound to fail. They got that one wrong. Uh, dare I say it, they also got the euro wrong as well. Now, of course, I'm an economist, uh, and so I'm going to speak to you mainly about economic matters. I'm going to talk about the WTO, customs, union, single market, and I'm going to conclude with a few words about Europe in the world. But I thought I would begin with just one remark about matters political, although it touches on matters economic, something very dear to my heart. If you listened to the BBC, particularly the BBC, uh, but also read accounts of this burning issue in the various media outlets, you'd get the impression that Brexit was really about such matters as integrated supply chains. <laughs> I am fed up with so many business people apparently taking over this issue or trying to take it over as though the apparent interests of their own businesses, short-term apparent interests, somehow trumped everything else. Um, <laughs> Brexit is primarily about sovereignty. <laughs> and the economic issues, important though they are, frankly, are subsidiary to that. If we get our sovereignty back, then we will also get control out of, over various ultra-important economic issues. But that's the way to look at it. It shouldn't be the head of XYZ Motor Manufacturing Plant who dictates to this country our political arrangements. It should be the British people. <laughs> now let me move on to, as it were, my own narrow territory uh, of economics. I want to start off by saying a few words about the so-called no-deal option. And the first thing to say, and some of you who read my column in the Tory graph may be uh, familiar with this argument anyway, uh, it isn't really a no-deal option at all. It's a misnomer. It's a multi-deal option. And the multi-deals are, first of all, a set of side arrangements and agreements about a whole range of things, which have already begun, by the way. There was an announcement just the other day of Spain uh, being prepared to agree the voting rights of British citizens in Spain, and we would do the same for them. A whole series of agreements, which, quite frankly, we ought to have been setting out uh, to arrange and to do right from the very beginning, rather than pursuing this absolutely mad and bonkers withdrawal agreement that Mrs May, uh, I'm afraid, was seduced by. But that's not the only set of agreements. There's also the prospect of a free trade agreement with the EU. Again, this is what we should have been thinking about from the beginning. Just because we don't sign this particular deal doesn't mean to say we won't have any deal. Both sides have got a strong self-interest in having free trade between our two economic areas, and that's what we should be setting about doing as and when we know that we're out. And then, of course, there are all the agreements and deals to be signed with countries all around the world, free trade agreements from America, perhaps that'll be the first, all the way down. Uh, this is a multi-deal option. It isn't a no-deal option. Uh, actually, of course, when people contemplate this and they go on to... Uh, perhaps bring in some more detail, they quite rightly uh, come up with the WTO, which you've already heard about, the World Trading Organization. We would be trading under WTO rules. I can't tell you the number of times I've read or heard the other side saying the equivalent of, oh, wouldn't this be a leap in the dark? <laughs> you must be joking. We do the majority of our trade around the world outside the EU under WTO terms. Far from being a leap into the dark, it would be a leap into the familiar. <laughs> now, the customs union, as and when we leave without a deal, we're leaving the customs union and leaving the single market. Let's try and unpick what this involves. If we leave the customs union, of course, some people remarkably want to stay in the customs union. I can't think why. Uh, one of the immediate consequences would be that tariffs 
unless we reach some separate arrangement, tariffs would be imposed on both sides, they on us and us on them. And under WTO rules, we would be obliged to impose the same tariffs, or at least no higher tariffs on them, that we impose uh, on uh, imports from the rest of the world. So we can assume, I think as a first guess, that we would end up imposing the current common European tariffs, uh, which are for manufactured goods somewhere in the range 3 to 4% on average, although they do vary quite a lot. And similarly, they would impose those tariffs on us. Now, we're invited by some people to, to imagine that this is a complete disaster, 3 to 4%. Honestly, the currency markets make moves of that magnitude regularly, one week after the other, and then reverse the, the move. And in any case, we've had a massive fall in the pound since the referendum vote in 2016. I really cannot believe that if we do end up imposing tariffs it's going to, of that magnitude, it's going to have a major uh, impact. In fact, we could perhaps end up not imposing tariffs at all. Uh, over recent weeks, not before time, some attention has come to be given to a thing called Article 24, not the wretched EU's Article 24, Lisbon Treaty, but Article 24 of the GATT uh, arrangements transposed into the WTO, under which it is possible for two countries to forego the usual rules about imposing tariffs, to have no tariffs imposed on each other, even while they impose tariffs on the rest of the world, provided that they're in the process of negotiating a free trade agreement between each other. Now, it seems to me, I mean, there's a lot uh, of detail to be worked out here as to whether it would be feasible between our two parties, but actually I think it, there's a good chance that it would be. Isn't this a much more attractive and profitable route to have gone down than Mrs. May's ghastly withdrawal agreement? <laughs> the second aspect of leaving the customs union, of course, is that we would be able to negotiate our own free trade agreements around the world. Now, again, the opposition have got a very funny line on this. Uh, so often I hear the argument, oh, gosh, we'd be all on our own. We wouldn't be able to survive without the EU. The EU's got all this clout. Oh, dear. Well, it's true that the EU does have clout, but as in every other aspect of life, clout isn't everything. There's something about the difficulty of getting agreement between 28 different member countries. And indeed, when we, as we saw with the Canada agreement, it even extends to the Belgian province of Wallonia. They've got to agree as well. The simple fact of the matter is, and this is the result of work done by um, a remarkable chap called Michael Burridge, who's associated with economists for free trade, uh, it's quite clear that the record of the EU at securing free trade agreements is appalling. And it's appalling for very good reasons. Because it is this huge block of very diverse countries with very diverse interests. Everything to do with the EU takes ages and is ineffectual anyway. And this is a particular case of it. They've, got, they've had very few trade agreements around the world. And those that they do have tend to be uh, predominantly with former colonies. They don't cover services very well. The EU's record in negotiating FT, FTAs is appalling. And the idea that we somehow or other won't be able to cope without the EU doing our negotiating for us is thoroughly bizarre. Then we come on to the single market. Now, obviously, this is a big topic, and I'm not going to go into all sorts of things to do with uh, immigration and uh, free movement of people and so on. I wanted to talk just about the goods aspects uh, of what leaving the single market implies. And again, to listen to the other side of this debate, you get the impression that um, there are going to be huge problems at the borders uh, as and when we leave the single market, because goods won't be able to move seamlessly. There'll be all sorts of forms to fill in. There'll be inspections going on. And there'll be huge delays. Kent becomes a lorry park, and so on and so forth. I don't know how or why they've managed to get away, frankly, with this nonsense. We have so much evidence from businesses who are not committed, as many of our large international firms are, to the single market, who tell you that they trade under WTO terms uh, umpteen countries around the world, there isn't really a massive difference in the ease with which they can send goods to one place or another. 
Border frictions, massively overdone. I think we've all been, or rather they've been, watching too many old Second World War movies where, you know, sort of lorries covered in sort of tarpaulin, you know, approach the border and they're chaps in uniforms with guns and, you know, hidden in the back under some sort of another tarpaulin as the, the spy or the soldier or whatever. And it's desperately important they shouldn't be found. And the, the guard sort of prods this thing, you know, with a bayonet. He carries on prodding and inspects everything to make sure uh, no one's in there. And about sort of, you know, an hour later, to great relief, the lorry passes through. This is all baloney. International trade doesn't work that way. It's all done before the event electronically. And the notion that, you know, given uh, goodwill on both sides, we're going to have massive delays at the borders is really complete and utter nonsense. And of course, we have the, the uh, evidence of the ports of Calais and Boulogne, who've said as much. They've said, there's not going to be any problem, by the way. We're prepared for it. We've done all that's necessary. As far as we're concerned, you know, we want the trade to continue, and the goods are going to whiz through just as they do now. But there's actually a bit of macro evidence that I think is pretty important on this issue. And again, the other side so rarely pay attention to this. And it's, it's two-edged, really. First of all, if... The single market was this wonderful thing, the loss of which would have such dire consequences. Can someone please explain why the single market has not launched a wave of prosperity across Europe? Why are the likes of Italy and Greece not, you know, transported into prosperity by having all their lorries able to whiz through the borders? The evidence seems to be that, you know, mm, certain other things might count for really rather a lot. And these so-called frictionless borders, nice though they might be to have, don't really amount to a great deal. And the second bit of evidence, which I think is in many ways more impressive, again it comes from Michael Burridge, is that if you look at the performance of countries outside the single market, all around the world, all of them, the United States, Singapore, Korea, all that lot, exporting into the single market, do you know they're pretty good at it? They export large amounts into the single market. Uh, and indeed, the rate of increase of exports from by those countries into the single market is greater than the average of single market members to other single market members. Those pesky borders, you know, frictions, somehow or other, those countries around the world have managed to overcome those difficulties. And indeed, I'm sure we would. Which uh, also connects with integrated supply chains, where I started. There are, of course, businesses in this country that uh, operate integrated supply chains, and I've no doubt that the margin, things will be a little more difficult uh, once we've left the single market. I don't want to pretend otherwise. But the question is, what, you know, how important is this? If you listen to the other side of this debate, you get the impression that integrated supply chains only exist on the territory of the EU. No doubt, you know, given leave and permission and encouragement by the great European Commission. Well, I've got news for them. Funny enough, there are integrated supply chains operating all over Asia, over North and South America, and indeed across the whole world. And funny enough, they cross monetary barriers, customs barriers, tariff barriers, heaven knows what. The notion that we can't have integrated supply chains because we've left the EU is another complete and total myth. Uh, I'm tempted to ask, you know, I'm often tempted to ask, uh, these things seem so clear to me, and I guess they seem clear to many of you. What is it that separates us from them? What do the others believe that makes them think that, uh, you know, it would be such a disaster? So many of them sincerely do uh, to leave the EU. And I think there are two sorts of reasons, really. Um, the first is straightforwardly economic. That, that's to say that they mistakenly think that the EU is a great success story, and out on our own we would be floundering. I do wish they would look at the facts, because the facts are that although when we joined the EU initially, of course and called that then, of course, in 1973, the EU was a great relative success story relative to us and relative to many other parts of the world as well. It is no longer a success story. Uh, it is a slow growth area. It hasn't done well at all. Most recently, because of the euro, that idiotic idea, uh, but also before that and continuing afterwards, because of the way that the EU operates, intensely bureaucratic, desperately keen to integrate and harmonize. That's what it thinks the roots of economic success are, integration and harmonization. I wonder what dear old Lee Kuan Yew would have made of that. So they don't know the facts, and they also don't understand the arguments. So many of our political class haven't got a clue, in my view, there are certain honorable exceptions, uh, about, matters, about matters economic. 
Uh, there is a second uh, reason, though, why they take a different view. And in many ways, it's more disturbing, I think. Um, it's that they don't like the nation state. They really don't like the nation state. They think... <laughs> they think that the origin of so much that's wrong in the world uh, lies with the nation state. And they particularly don't like our nation state. And the result of this is that they're quite happy, delighted, to give sovereignty away to this entity called the EU, which they seem to imbue with all sorts of magical powers. In fact, the evidence of the EU's performance, of course, completely belies those magical powers. Um, there's one fact in this regard that, again, I find that, that not many people on the other side uh, are aware of, but I'm sure almost everyone in this audience is. Uh, and that's to say the history of the members of the EU with regard to invasion and dictatorship. There are only four members of the 28 that have never undergone in the last 100 years either invasion or dictatorship. Only four. And they are Ireland, Sweden, Malta, came pretty close, and the UK. This explains why the political culture of our country is so different from theirs. They're, very, they're quite happy to relinquish their identity and their institutions because in living memory, their institutions have failed and they, their identity has been bound up with failure and horror and terror, not of their own doing. Our history is different and we are different. Now this group, uh, of people on the other side who I think so often get things badly wrong economically and have this overarching vision against the nation state, against our nation state, and in favor of uh, that entity uh, inching as it is towards um, a federal super state. They have an appalling record of getting things wrong. I'm often asked by um, incredulous people, sometimes the BBC, oh, how come you're so confident about what you're saying? You know, the Treasury, the Bank of England, the OECD, the IMF, Uncle Contopoli, Con Con they all say something different, the opposite to you. And I reply, yes, I know, that's precisely why I'm so confident. <laughs> the record of the economic establishment comprising that gathering and you can mix in the CBI and a few other institutions is utterly appalling. Now the most recent bit of evidence of this was of course so-called Project Fear before the 2016 referendum where the Treasury goaded and encouraged by George Osborne then Chancellor of the Exchequer came out with these catastrophic forecasts for what would happen to the UK economy if we dared to vote for Brexit. In the end, of course, what happened is that the economy carried on growing, still is growing, all sorts of goodies uh, came our way, including a dramatic creation of jobs. But the record goes back a long way. 1931, which uh, sadly or not, I didn't experience directly myself, uh, that's a prime example when the establishment was desperate to keep Britain on the gold standard. If we leave the gold standard, all hell will break loose, it'll be a complete disaster. That's what the governor of the Bank of England said, that one then, by the way, uh, and aided and abetted by more or less the whole establishment, a single major voice dissenting, namely John Maynard Keynes, uh, and uh, the government of the day went to massive pains to stay on the gold standard, then of course eventually we were forced off, didn't choose by the way, we were forced off, 1931. What happened? What was the disaster? Well the disaster was the fastest sustained period of economic growth in the whole of our modern history. Funny that. <laughs> then we have the 1980s and the bold Thatcher reforms. The establishment was almost completely against what Mrs. Thatcher was trying to do. Where would we be without what she achieved in those years? They were completely and utterly wrong. Then we get the RM episode, 1992. Again, Britain didn't choose to leave. It should have done, but it didn't. We were fighting like crazy to stay in the RM, if you can remember. And 1992, September the 16th, 
Uh, we were forced out, and in the weeks up to that, the Treasury, the Bank of England, Uncle Tom Cobby, and all, all the usual suspects were saying, well, you had to stay in. You know, if we leave, oh, inflation will go up, interest rates will go up, unemployment will go up, it'll be a disaster. We didn't choose to leave because we were so scared by these warnings. We were forced out. What happened? Inflation fell, interest rates fell, unemployment fell, and the economy prospered. They were wrong again. Funny that. And then we come to the euro. And the same lot over again. By the way, there's a common theme in this, which is the CPI. <laughs> in the markets, which I used to work in, obviously it's wonderful to have a forecaster or a fund manager uh, or someone who can, you can rely on always to get things right. But it's actually, I think it's equally valuable to have one who always gets things wrong. And you just do the opposite. Well, the CPI is the equivalent of this. Whatever they pronounce on, my working assumption is that's 180 degrees wrong. Let's do the opposite. <laughs> well, the euro was the same. They wanted us to join the euro. And we got forecasts then, didn't we? The Japanese car manufacturers, they were all going to decamp. Uh, the uh, banks were going to leave. Oh, the city was going to be a terrible state because Frankfurt, yes, Frankfurt, was going to take over the city. Have you been there? <laughs> I mean, the, the idea of Frankfurt taking over the city of London, it really is bizarre. They said it then, it would be a it would be disaster. And of course, what's happened since is that uh, the British economy has outgrown the uh, Eurozone economy by a massive amount. Outgrown France and Germany, by the way, uh, as well as, of course, Italy. Spain is the only country, major country, that's done better than us since the Euro was formed in 1999. Now, let me bring my remarks to a close by saying something about Europe in the world. Uh, but I think this is uh, deeply relevant to what we're discussing today. Uh, Europe has been in relative decline. Now, partly that's for reasons that the, nothing much that Europe can do about it. It's the rapid advance of other countries that started behind. But there's also something else. There's all these appalling decisions, the terrible bureaucracy, the euro, and so on and so forth. A whole series of indicators showing that Europe is falling behind. Um, so I just wonder, you know, when you travel around the world, and of course so many of the countries are doing very well are in Asia. Uh, my firm happens to have an office in Singapore, so I go there quite a lot. I'm a great admirer of Singapore. But it's also true of other countries in the region, you know, Taiwan, Korea, China. Do you suppose that when the governments of these countries contemplate a major policy measure, it might be taxes, it might be expenditure, it might be transport system, it might be education, do you think they start by saying to themselves, oh, What's the EU doing? Should we copy that? <laughs> well, let me let you into a secret. No, they don't. And adopting the 180 degree principle, what they do is, what is the EU doing? That's a pretty good idea. Let's do the opposite. <laughs> so here we have so many countries in Asia in particular, but also around the world, prospering, concentrating on the real sources of economic growth, not bothering about harmonization and integration. They're not bothered about common currencies, monetary unions, fiscal unions, political unions, and they've worked out, funnily enough, that they don't need all that stuff. Well, I've got news. We don't need it either. Thank you very much. <laughs>